This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished. Where is the church going? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly... May you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Welcome to episode 67 of the Naked Mormonism podcast, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Today is Thursday, September 7th, 2017. My name is Bryce Blankenagle, and thank you for joining me. On this episode, we try to gain new perspectives. John Bennett addresses the Brethren during the October of 1840 conference to gain access to the in-group of trusted Mormon leadership with a new rule requiring two or three witnesses to any crime. How would this affect polygamy as it begins to lurk underneath the surface of Nauvoo? Then we bring on a very special guest to discuss the plight of women's rights in the 19th century and how having a child out of wedlock essentially condemned single mothers to a life of misery and hardship. Let's get into it. Last episode was almost exclusively history. We read straight through the Nauvoo Charter, which was adopted by the Church High Council as an approved charter for the city of Nauvoo, sent to be pushed through the Illinois legislature in the most expeditious possible way. Joe, John Brokett, and Robert B. Thompson had to put this thing together, essentially copying most of it directly from the Springfield City Charter. But they added some important provisions, which gave the Nauvoo government some incredible powers when all clauses in the charter were combined together. Among the regular organizational efforts to put the charter in place, it also granted Nauvoo its own militia to be designated the Nauvoo Legion. It granted power of the mayor to issue writs of habeas corpus to any government body holding any prisoner for any reason to be extradited immediately to Nauvoo, and it issued the regulations necessary to reliably collect taxes on the citizens of Nauvoo, establishing a much-needed revenue stream to build the city and pay its never-ending well of debts, which were beginning to cause some discomfort for Joe and the leadership. With the combination of everything included in the Nauvoo Charter, Joe was basically untouchable once the charter application passed the Illinois legislature. We've had some milk to tease our appetite. Let's satiate our historical hunger with some meat. As the scriptures say, they must have milk before meat. Perspective is a powerful concept with which the human mind constantly wrestles. What does it take to shift a person's perspective? I mean, even that one question introduces all kinds of variables. You know, how are you trying to shift a person's perspective? What would you like the person to see that they aren't already seeing? What's the most effective way to shift their perception? Is it even possible to shift their perspective, or are they too entrenched and closed-minded to even consider any alternate perspective? As an extension of these questions... What barriers exist which inhibit someone considering a new perspective? I'm a constant advocate for education of all kinds, because I think it's the only way to shatter ignorance. One mechanism by which to accomplish said education is offering new perspectives in a way which is digestible to whomever is receiving the education. Now, I want you to think back to a time when you learned something which truly shifted your understanding of something in your life. I won't offer any examples, because this is up to you to just think of something. But just think of any time in your life that you gained a whole new understanding of a topic or an issue or an entire field of study. 
I'd be willing to assert that your change of mind came from a source which offered a different perspective than what you were used to. Whether it was a conversation with somebody who offered that perspective or reading a book, maybe listening to a podcast or an audiobook, or even just overhearing a conversation. It's the fundamental way humans learn new information by communicating with each other and offering one another new perspectives. We can see the evolutionary benefit to communicating those new perspectives. What's beyond that hill over there? Well, I, I talked to a guy yesterday who came from that direction and it turns out there's great hunting grounds and fertile soil. Our God probably promised the land to us. Well, what dangers lie in the woods over yonder? Oh, well, I, I heard someone talking about great monsters which rule the woods, so if we go in there, we'll likely die. All right, then, we'll, we'll just settle up to the woods and leave them be so that we can survive and have more children. Maybe once we have a few thousand warriors together, we'll go explore the woods and kill those great beasts that rule the woods before they can kill us. Of course, God will watch over us as we conquer the forest because the prophet told us that he promised us the land. God always knows exactly what our tribe needs. Let's discuss the obstacles which force us to consider a new perspective. There may be simply physical limitations, which are completely understandable. You know, if you take an iPad back to the 1950s, you would watch people's brains melt because our modern perspective would seem too far out of reality for them to realistically consider. That's a practical limitation to changing someone's mind. And we can excuse people from the 20th century for not understanding our perspective. Much less excusable, though, is people who refuse to accept a shift in perception because they want to believe their perspective so much that no other perspective matters. Or maybe they're too afraid of what the other perspective has to offer. Maybe they're too afraid of the monsters that rule the woods. The reason I bring this up in the first place is due to a post on the ex-Mormon subreddit by username Sage Owl. It was talking about a, an M. Russell Ballard talk during the October 2016 conference, and the talk is titled, To Whom Shall We Go? The Reddit post was brilliant, and I'm just going to read it here to offer some context. The title of the post was, Oh Snap! When Ballard said, Where Will You Go? He was talking to himself, and the subtext of the post said, quote, He's trapped. He feels trapped. Down in his subconscious, where all the doubt and questions and individuality have been squashed and hidden away over the decades. One of the memes he uses to keep those ghosts down is, Where will you go? Outside the church, he's just a used car salesman in a cult. Where will you go is what he says to himself, end quote. Quite the amazing observation by Sage Owl. And I would add that fear of the unknown is probably what keeps Ballard from even considering an alternate perspective or considering that that perspective might even be correct. Ballard is too far entrenched in his own beliefs as an apostle of the church to shift his perspective. And I had to chase down the video of this talk to see the quote in context, and I'm happy to extract a few gems and read them here for you guys. Quote, For some, Christ's invitation to believe and remain continues to be hard or difficult to accept. Some disciples struggle to understand a specific church policy or teaching. Others find concerns in our history or in the imperfections of some members and leaders, past and present. Still, others find it difficult to live a religion that requires so much. For these and other reasons, some members vacillate in their faith. If any one of you is faltering in your faith, I ask you the same question as Peter asked. To whom shall you go? If you choose to become inactive or leave the restored church of Jesus Christ, where will you go? What will you do? Here are a couple of other quotes from later in the video. There may be some doctrines, some policy, some bit of history which puts you at odds with your faith, and you may feel that the only way to resolve the inner turmoil is to walk no more with the saints. If you live as long as I have, you'll come to know that things have a way of resolving themselves. Never abandon the great truths revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith. Never stop reading, pondering, and applying the doctrine of Christ contained in the Book of Mormon. We must not assume that just because something is unexplainable by us, that it is unexplainable. The danger comes when someone chooses to wander away from the path that leads to the tree of life. Sometimes we can learn, study, and know, and sometimes we have to believe, trust, and hope. In the end, each one of us must respond to the Savior's question, Will ye also go away? We all have to search for our own answer to that question. 
end quote. There are a few other gems in that video, and check the show notes for a link. It's it's 14 minutes, and uh, it's fascinating. Altogether, he said, where will you go 10 times? With variants of that question racking up the total tally to just under one of those questions per minute. Ballard did briefly talk about times when he's had issues with the church, but somehow his personal revelation and spiritual experiences always won out. And I think this only adds to the claim that Sage Owl made that Ballard was just saying this to himself more than the members. When somebody is too deeply entrenched in their beliefs that they refuse to see a different perspective, that's a terrifying question. And to, to rephrase the question, or to put it more bluntly, if everything I believe is wrong, what do I do now? Who do I talk to? Who could understand what I know? Where will I go? What will I do? Those are tough questions. And this question plagues the Mormon community. If the church isn't true, how can my life continue? And this kind of gets to the crux of the issue. Sometimes when you gain a whole new perspective on something you've considered an undefeatable truth, which makes it seem less true or wholly false, it's tough to reconcile that in your mind. Cognitive dissonance is powerful, and you're forced to include ancillary issues to rationalize believing in something that isn't true. Now, I've been in a number of conversations with TBMs who say, even if the church isn't true, it's a great way to raise a family. The Hitler Youth was a great way to raise children. It doesn't mean that Arianism is the one true race. This is a red herring in the conversation about what makes something true or not. Refusing to consider the new perspective and evaluate it based on its own merits does a disservice to yourself and the human race as a whole. This gets to a major problem with anybody who claims to be a prophet. By definition, a prophet refuses to see anybody else's perspective as accurate because they hold the one singular truth. They talk to God. If a person is a prophet, they can't possibly be wrong because they are the ones talking to God who knows everything that there ever was, is, or could be known. Built into that role is a failure to learn anything, consider new information, or even approach a new perspective with any level of open-mindedness. Through what I consider refusal to consider a new perspective, Joseph Smith truly couldn't understand why things weren't going well for him and the saints in Nauvoo. Page 189 of the Dan Vogel History of the Church includes this entry with regards to the Missouri-Mormon conflict throughout 1838. Quote, The governor of Missouri, after a silence of about two years, has at last made a demand of Governor Carlin of Illinois for Joseph Smith Jr., Sidney Rigdon, Lyman White, Parley P. Pratt, Caleb Baldwin, and Allenson Brown as fugitives from justice. The demand, it seems, has been complied with by Governor Carlin and an order issued for their apprehension. Accordingly, our place has recently received a visit from the sheriff for these men. But through the tender mercies of a kind providence, who by his power has sustained and once delivered them from the hands of the bloodthirsty and savage race of beings in the shape of men that treat Missouri's delightful soil, they were not to be found. As the Lord would have it, they were gone from home, and the sheriff returned, of course, without them. These men do not feel disposed to again try the solemn realities of mob law in that state, and a free and enlightened republic should respond against it. For Missouri has no claim on them, but they have claim on Missouri. What right have they to demand of Governor Carlin as fugitives from justice men against whom no process has ever been found in that state? No, not so much as the form of process. They were taken by a mob militia and dragged from everything that was dear and sacred and tried without their knowledge by a court-martial condemned to be shot. But failing in this, they were forced into confinement, galled with chains, deprived of the comforts of life, and even that which is necessary to save life, then brought to a pretended trial without even having a legal process served, and then deprived of the privilege of defense. They were taken by a mob, tried, condemned, and imprisoned by the same, and this Missouri cannot deny, end quote. This was published in the Times and Seasons in September of 1840. Undoubtedly written by Smith or one of his cronies, if you listen to the episodes where we cover the history of the church in Missouri, you know just how profoundly ignorant these statements were. Ignorance is merely one manifestation of refusal to understand new perspectives. 
Apparently, Joe and the Mormons couldn't empathize with the perspective of the Missourians, who truly hated the Mormons for myriad reasons. It's understandable, though, right? It's hard to put yourself in your enemy's shoes to see things how they see it. It's hard to gain the motivation to even want to view the world through your enemy's eyes. But Joe's inability to empathize or alter his perspective would do himself a great disservice for the rest of his short life. You can learn a lot about a person and prepare for incredible unforeseen circumstances if you ask yourself what is the best or worst possible scenario that could come out of any given circumstance. You know, changing your perspective. Now, mapping that to see another person's perspective, what is the best or worst thing this person could want? What is the best or worst thing this person could do to me? If I do X, what is a likely possible Y that somebody could do which would land at scenario Z? You know, planning things, trying to shift your perspective to the future. I'm going to pose a couple of questions that Joe could have asked himself, which would require him gaining a new perspective, but it could have insulated him from some bad actors or possibly mitigated some of the damage done so publicly by his closest acolytes. What is the history of this John Bennett guy? What's the worst thing he could do to hurt me in the church? Is Isaac Galland as good of a guy as he claims to be? If I don't fulfill the contracts that I made with Hotchkiss, could he do anything that would crumble the foundation of the church in Nauvoo? What should I do if we can't raise enough tithes and taxes to pay for all the land contracts that I signed to secure the settlement for the saints? Each and every one of these questions presents an opportunity for Joe to insulate himself from likely damage which would occur in the future. But I must speculate that Joe was an eternal optimist, because I don't think he ever asked any of these questions or cared to gain these new perspectives in any regard. It requires us empathizing with Joe's mindset to understand why he may never have asked these things. So let's try to gain a new perspective through Joe's eyes. Everything Joe did was interpreted through the eyes of a God-fearing man. When his life was going well, he was favored of the Lord. When things weren't going well, he was somehow doing something that God didn't like, or you know, the saints needed to repent for their iniquity or something to that effect. Unfortunately, a person like Joe likely saw everything in his day-to-day -day life as some manifestation of God's will. When he had lost and then found the keys to his carriage, it was God's will, and he was favored. When Galland approached him with the perfect land purchase agreement, which would secure a place for the saints to settle in Illinois and Iowa— it was obviously divine providence. You know, <laughs> it probably didn't even occur to Joe that Isaac Galland was a self-serving bastard and was looking to make a quick buck off of some religious refugees who had no other options. In Joe's mind, it was just God smiling down upon his chosen people. This metric is useful for God-fearing folk to understand if they are doing the right thing or not. You know, luck, basically. You know, I, I remember, you know, this, this is kind of an ancillary point, but I remember hearing my dad tell me as a kid that if I experienced deja vu, it meant that I was at the right place doing the right thing in my own life. And that was how God approved of what I was doing by giving me a feeling of deja vu. Of course, I didn't then, nor do I now understand the complicated brain chemistry, which creates the feeling of deja vu. And uh, th there's a naturalistic explanation for it. But in a similar vein, you know, just like deja vu, good luck can easily be interpreted by the God-fearing as divine providence. What secular people call a good day could easily be interpreted as being blessed and in the favor of God. But isn't that a metric which begs to be misused and misinterpreted by those with certain motivations, particularly those motivations of self-aggrandizement? If somebody is truly an asshole, but they're a lucky asshole— couldn't said asshole construe their actions as being divinely approved? It's all a matter of perspective. So speaking in the vein of bastards and assholes, let's talk about John Bennett. A broke it, as we know him. A guy who had no problem interpreting the will of God to be whatever he wanted. Broke it could be considered lucky and ambitious, making a dangerous combination to Joe, who, at this time, probably felt like John Bennett was a gift from God. During the October of 1840 conference, John Bennett made his first public address to the Brethren. The conference went for three days during the first weekend of October, and Brokett spoke at some length during all three days. 
His topic of presentation on Monday, however, is the most fascinating by my metrics, and we'll get to that very soon. But his first address was on Saturday, October 3rd, 1840. It was very simple. If I were to try and put myself in Brokett's shoes and see things through his perspective, I would wager that his first address was calculated to gain the favor of the brethren. This is the passage out of the Dan Vogel History of the Church, Volume 4, page 196. Quote, John C. Bennett, M.D., then spoke at some length on the oppression to which the church had been subject and remarked that it was necessary for the brethren to stand by each other and resist every unlawful attempt at persecution, end quote. Once the Nauvoo Charter was passed, which was actually approved by the brethren during this meeting, it could be interpreted that nearly any lawful prosecution was unlawful persecution from the perspective of Joe and the Saints. But that's kind of beside the point that I'm slowly meandering towards right now. The second day of the conference, Brokett spoke a bit more on some deeper topics than just telling the brethren what they already knew concerning their year in Missouri. From later on in the same page, quote, Dr. John C. Bennett from the committee to draft a charter for the city and for other purposes reported the outlines of the same. On motion, resolved that the same be adopted. Dr. Bennett then made some very appropriate remarks on the duty of the saints in regard to those who had, under circumstances of affliction, held out the hand of friendship, and that it was their duty to uphold such men and give them their suffrages and support, end quote. And it should be taken in as a side note, Dr. John C. Bennett was one of those people who was in a position of power who, quote unquote, held out his hand of friendship. So that's eh, just a side note. The next paragraph is fascinating, and this is just another side point. It says, quote, Elder Ebenezer Robinson then rose and gave an account of the printing of another edition of the Book of Mormon and stated that it was now nearly completed and that arrangements had been made for the printing of the hymn book, Book of Doctrine and Covenants, etc., end quote. So now the 1840 Nauvoo edition of the Book of Mormon was just about ready to ship in October, early October 1840. Like I said, that's just a side note, but let's continue on with what Brokett was talking about here, because what he had to say on the third and final day of the conference, Monday, October 5th, 1840, is the most fascinating. Quote, Dr. John C. Bennett said that many persons had been accused of crime and been looked upon as guilty when, on investigation, it had been ascertained that nothing could be adduced against them. Whereupon, on motion, it was resolved that no person be considered guilty of a crime unless proved so by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's powerful. We'll talk about it in a second. He next brought before the conference the treatment the saints had experienced in Missouri and wished to know whether the conference would take any further steps in relation to obtaining redress. On motion, resolved that Elias Higby and Robert B. Thompson be appointed a committee to obtain redress for the wrongs sustained in Missouri, end quote. They just wouldn't let that go. They really wanted to get paid by the government. So let's take a step back real quick and think about what Brokett was just able to accomplish during this three-day conference. Let's try to see Brokett's perspective and combine it with questioning uh, what the, the most sinister possible motives he could have for presenting these things in the conference. Now, this is pure speculation that I'm concluding with a little bit of historical hindsight, given everything that would happen in the near future with Brokett. So before I offer my musings and try to, you know, cue you into my perspective of this, I'm going to ask it of you. What do you think that Brokett was trying to accomplish here? Consider things from his perspective with the knowledge that he was a self-serving rat bastard who likely thought more with his deck head than his actual head. He was obviously trying to insert himself into the in-group of the brethren with his appeals to how terrible the persecution had been in Missouri. Winning these guys over may have been a bit of a challenge because so many of them had been burned before by trusted guys in the highest echelons of Mormonism, like Dr. Samson Avard and Thomas B. Marsh. So Bennett was obviously vying for their approval. But what motivations may have been lurking underneath the surface? This is my take on it. I would argue that Bennett knew the church may be paid out a large settlement from the government soon enough. And if he were in the trusted in-group of Joe's best friends, he may somehow benefit from that. Now remember this, before Joe went out to Washington, D.C. at the end of 1839 to the beginning of 1840, the brethren voted that Joe would be placed in charge of all of the land acquired by the church and placed in the office of trustee and trust of all church finances. If the Mormons were paid by the government, Joe would become offensively wealthy, and Brokett would undoubtedly personally gain from that. 
But let's extend the implications to what Brokett had voted in with any accusation requiring two or three witnesses for conviction. Let's view this scenario through accusations which would soon plague the Mormon leadership's very existence. All right, this is just a possible little scenario. You know, let's say that Brokett may have had some relations with another man's wife. Okay, maybe this might be how that conversation would play out. Hey, man, John, you fucked my wife. Well, well, no, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. Well, where's your proof? Well, my, my wife told me you did while I was out on my mission. Well, do you have the requisite two or three witnesses to the crime? Is she pregnant with my child? Well, I, I, no, but she, I, she said that you drugged her and she doesn't remember what happened after that. Well, until you have evidence or witnesses or until your wife bears a child with my likeness, I can be convicted of no crime. It's what the brethren voted. <laughs> I mean, you see how convenient this would become in the near future? With requiring two or three witnesses, how do you exactly prove that Brokett had relations with uh, another man's wife? Or that Joe may have done something like that? Yeah. <laughs> and to extend this further, John Bennett had some training as a medical doctor, whatever that meant back then. And he was likely able to perform abortions by administering herbal remedies of ergot and rye and uh, um, henbane and other uh, offensive herbs or you know, through actual like coat hanger type abortions. So there actually wouldn't be any evidence of him committing adultery or even rape for that matter. And do you think that they would trust the testimony of a single woman as opposed to a trusted leader of the Mormon religion? So we need to broach a bit of a sensitive topic here, okay? When we talk about abortion in the early church, it's always a sensitive subject, particularly because, you know, even today, it's a highly charged and politicized topic of debate. For Mormons to consider that the founding prophet of the church used abortions to cover up sexual indiscretions is understandably a tough issue to approach without causing some offense. The primary reason abortion is so charged is because it's a topic centered around women's autonomy and ability to choose what they want to do with their own bodies and lives, while at the same time it's an issue of the sanctity of life of the unborn fetus. It's hard enough trying to convince people of the importance of women's autonomy nowadays, Imagine how hard of a sell that was to early 19th century Christians who would be considered way right of the most far right groups by today's standards. Let's bring in some perspective to this topic. Until very recently, women's worth has largely been determined by their chastity and their ability to bear strong sons for their husband. Some cultures still enshrine such antiquated ideals even today, Mormonism included. Historically speaking, the options for a woman who was unmarried with child were disturbingly limited. Women either had to find a man who would marry them regardless of the bastard child, or it was off to the brothels with them. I can't even pretend to see life through the eyes of women facing the social implications of having a child out of wedlock, or having to deal with the decision of an abortion for whatever reason, but I'm exponentially less qualified to discuss the plight of women facing those choices in the 19th century. To help me broach this subject, I'm bringing on Marie Kent, my wonderful co-host on the My Book of Mormon podcast, where we read through the Doctrine and Covenants every week. Marie, it's been a while since you've been on the show. Thanks for joining me after much ado. I am so glad to be here. And of all things, I get to talk about women's rights. I love it. Thank you, Bryce. Right? I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can talk about this till I'm blue in the face, but it's not like it really affects me on a personal level the way that it might affect, um, you know, women in the country. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this obviously we've we've exchanged a couple of articles back and forth uh, in preparation for this. And uh, let's just say women are exponentially more. They have far more available options to them than they did uh, compared to the 19th century. So I, I can't really talk about this with any sort of like firsthand experience or like any sort of uh, like temporality to this because I, I'm simply uninformed and I'm in a privileged position that I don't have to deal with these politicized issues on a day to day basis. So, you know, that's, that's hopefully some explanation for why I'm bringing you on. Yeah. Well, I, I am qualified in some regards here because I am, first of all, I'm a woman and I'm a woman of childbearing age. I have two children, which means that clearly 
child rearing and child bearing has been a major part of my life because, again, I have two children. But this is also a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, abortion and also birth control and everything surrounding that because I had a very high risk pregnancy with my second. And I, I don't want to say very high risk as in I was like hospitalized the entire time. But without the aid of modern medicine, I would have died. And I firmly believe that childbearing is something that should be everyone's choice because everyone has a different reason for why they want or don't want to do it, either their religion tells them they should and they agree with that or they just want to have a child or some combination of that where they do or they don't. Like It's deeply personal, but I don't think that anybody should have to have a child if they know that they're probably going to die to do so. Yeah, I <laughs> and think so, that's well, fair. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, like it's the same reason why I don't think that military service should be compulsory because when you're in the military, sometimes you die. I also don't think that you should be required to get a driver's license because when you're driving a car, sometimes you die. And with childbearing, obviously the risk in that is on the woman because men typically don't die de during childbirth. You know, that's just not. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends, but typically not. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and so like there are there are lots of reasons to need an abortion. The ones that we talk about today are primarily um, it's it, it's like well why don't you want this child? You shouldn't have had sex if you weren't going to have this child because today in 2017 women do have some not complete but they have some access to birth control that can come in the forms of condoms or birth control pills or IUDs or you know like the there is a wide range of, of possibilities. But back in the day, so like 1830s, 1840s, um, that wasn't the case. So the, like it, it, it gets really tricky once you get back in the back in the old days of like what did women do? Because women still had the same biological needs to protect themselves and their families back then. They just didn't they couldn't go to their their local doctor and be like, Hey, can I have birth control pills? And the doctor's like, Yeah, here you go, and then you're fine. Like yeah. women have always had to figure out a way, even when there wasn't technically a way that should have been available to them. And let's just say this at the outset. Um, obviously, abortion is a lot less um, physically costly than going through with a pregnancy. There are a lot less dangers associated with uh, abortion as opposed to going through with a pregnancy. And that's – and, you know, a lot of the dangers that women encounter when they are, you know, pregnant are mitigated by our incredible level of scientific knowledge concerning medicine. But in the 1800s, they didn't have so much of what we consider mainstream medicine nowadays that can mitigate those those costs so and those uh you know those risks so back in the 1800s when a woman was uh pregnant and it was you know a quote unquote high risk pregnancy they didn't necessarily have the options that women have today in order to you know survive said pregnancy and oftentimes they would fall victim to their own childbirth so yeah. uh, <laughs> oftentimes abortion was the only form of saving women's lives. Mm -hmm. And there's also things like today when we're talking about high risk pregnancy, there are things that we know because we have tests for that that they didn't have back then. So like I yeah. personally, yeah, I had something called cholestasis of pregnancy, which is a fancy way of saying that my body was growing bigger than my liver could handle it. And oh, wow. yeah, so the problem with your liver not working is that your liver is not working. So you're yeah. like, you're slowly poisoning yourself. And so wow. in my case, it's um, because we have tests for this, you, they can like draw your blood and they can look at it. So I was monitored like every time I went in, they checked you like, okay, so how dangerous is this for you? So we would have a discussion. Like, are, should we, should we have a C scheduled C-section now? Should we wait until like, how, how old is your fetus? But even back then, it's like, well, it's not like they could say, oh, well, I definitely conceived on Tuesday of March and therefore I'm the, like, <laughs> they didn't have any of these things. <laughs> so yeah, they, they couldn't exactly shoot an ultrasound in there to see how far along the baby was or anything as well. I mean, no, like, what are they going to do? Are they going to do a C-section in the middle of a field in Ohio or something? <laughs> like the thing is, you would just die. So you would die at the ripe old age, age of childbirth. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's if you knew there was a problem. So if you... If you did know and you realized that you were not feeling great and you were – of all the things that were going wrong, you knew that it was bad, 
that's when it gets tricky. <laughs> or if you want Absolutely. to hide that there was a there was a pregnancy happening at all because you were quote unquote married to your prop to the prophet, but you were also I don't know young and technically according to society not married. So there's all of the shame and the stigma associated with that. Right, yeah. right. It, yeah. yeah. The, well, I wanted to get into that topic because everything we've discussed so far is essentially the medical side of it. But yeah. I think the social side of it is where the arguments really p- kind of play out and where uh, both sides seem to have a their own like their own trenches that they've dug and they try to sit in mm-hmm. when it's such a highly nuanced topic and there are so many social issues that play into this larger discussion. So, friend of the show, Julie, uh, Marie, you actually met Julie at Sunstone. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I like her very much. She's great. She is amazing. She helps out with the Facebook and Twitter pages. She's just an awesome friend. Um, she sent over this article that I said to you, Marie, and this is on Elle Magazine Online, and it's titled, What Abortion Was Like in the 19th Century, with a subtitle of, To Be Unmarried and Pregnant Meant Deep Trouble. And it was written by Kate Manning. If anyone wants to read this, there will be a link in the show notes. Uh, and it's it's just a really interesting take on the history of abortion, essentially. So, Marie, I'm hoping that we can maybe take a couple of ex- extracts from this to try and get some perspective of these issues surrounding women's autonomy and pregnancy from a 19th century perspective. Does that sound good to you? Absolutely. Bring it on. All right, so I'm going to read uh, one of the first paragraphs out of it. It says, quote, In the 1800s, unmarried pregnant girls like Maria, that was the focus of the article, were in deep trouble. Religious ideas about sin held that women's virtue was ruined if she had sex outside of marriage. Thus, disgraced, a woman had few options if her seducer refused to marry her. Often she was banished, forced to live apart from family and community. This was an era when birth control was not widely available or reliable. Women could not vote, own property, or control their own money. They could also be committed to an insane asylum on the say-so of a man. Countless quote-unquote fallen women who'd been raped or jilted by their lovers had to resort to prostitution to make ends meet. Prostitutes lived an average of about four years, falling victim to violence and venereal disease. Wow. As for surrendering a child for adoption, in the mid-1800s, there were 30,000 homeless children living on the New York streets and no reliable foster care or orphan asylums, end quote. (laughs) Yep, that sums it up. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, if you were an unmarried woman with a child, you you were defiled by their standards. And... I think it's interesting to see it through this this historical lens because it seems to contextualize so much of our culture today. Knowing that we evolved from this type of mindset and this this uh, the same arguments that they were having back then, we're just having slightly evolved versions of those same arguments nowadays. It's kind of baffling to see so many similarities. Well, in my perspective, it's not baffling at all because. <sighs> When you, when I think about um, what happens when you are, uh, when you are raped or you are, or basically you are pregnant against your will, there's a lot of lot hidden behind that of what did the woman do to bring that on herself? Because as a culture, we aren't taught, hey, hey, men, don't rape women. We teach women don't wear a short skirt, don't walk outside alone after night, and, like when it's dark. And there, our justice system on paper, it says if you've raped someone, then yes, there are consequences. But in practice, it's very much a, a he said, she said kind of thing. Like, so yes, the, what we have today is <laughs> founded in this horrible 1800s when all these things we just discussed happened. But I like, I'm not, I'm not surprised, is what I'm saying. Like, I feel like I should be surprised. But I'm like, well, no, because we it, in our society in America, it's like, well, obviously the woman did something wrong. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And there's also the concept of consent that today in 2017, we're teaching our children that you always ask people before you give them a hug. Like you don't require your children, at least in in my circles, we're teaching our children, you don't automatically tell your child, say goodbye to whoever by giving them a hug. we, We give them an option. Like you can wave or you can do a fist bump. Like, because we're teaching that your body isn't something that someone else should ever be able to be like, you have to hug me. You have to do this. Like we're teaching, no, everyone should ask first. Everyone's body is their own. 
But right. this is scaling it back to where women were property. And so like is it like is it rape if a husband does it? That's still a debate today. <laughs> but put it yeah, back then no when kidding. it's yeah, when it's not just um did did your husband rape you, but your husband can't because you're married. There's also you are the you are the servant in this household, so you are kind of owned by the man of that household. So if the man of that household rapes you, well, are, isn't it your fault for tempting him away? And mm. it, you, now you're, it's your fault that you're pregnant because you didn't know how to close your legs, Missy. You know, like yeah. that <laughs> con- yeah. c- consent, very different back then. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the the implications of all of these things and the, the I guess the mechanism behind it is shame, right? And public mm-hmm. shame. If you do or if something like this happens to you, then you should be shamed for, you know, like you said, not being able to keep your legs closed or whatever the case is. It's mm-hmm. And I'm I'm glad that what you're saying right now is so so important, and I'm hoping that it is being more and more introduced into uh, younger generations now. That you ask somebody to hug them, right? You don't just like come up and give them a hug. You you like it. It starts at a very young age, learning your own autonomy and everybody else's autonomy. And the more that we can kind of set that precedent for children to go up in for our society, I think the better off we're going to be in the long run, the more we're going to be able to shirk these 19th century ideals that evolved from what culture has been ever before that, right? Yeah. Well, part of what's also changing is the idea of equality and also the idea of inequality because our nation was founded under quote unquote equality but what they were really meant was equality for white men <laughs> and yeah. equa- equality yeah. for mostly white men who also owned land so the rich people in other words the people who were in power already were writing laws and a society to keep them in power but also giving them more power within their own power if that makes yeah, sense of course yep. <laughs> and fundamentally Uh, This concept of ownership and equality, so women were basically owned by the man in their life, either their father or their husband or whoever they were kind of working for, uh, only unofficially. And But to give women the choice of whether or not to have a child if a bad situation has happened or if they aren't able to support a child on their own, which like women were being set up at this time, that they could never do this alone because they couldn't have, they couldn't own things. They couldn't manage their own money. They couldn't have their own house. Like all of this inequality combined with consent. So then I, I'm just bringing myself back to what if I was part of a religion where I was being told you have to not only have as many babies as possible, regardless of your health, but the man who is in charge here, which is Joseph at this time. Um, one thing that you and I, Bryce, have realized as we're reading through the Doctrine and Covenants is that he keeps on giving revelations that solidify his power for both him and his closest friends. So, like, of course. Yeah, it's like the, the church doesn't have any money, but he decides to revelate the need that he gets a house in Kirtland <laughs> and his closest <laughs> friends get a house in Kirtland. Yeah, <laughs> like, so he's he's revelating, give, give me more power, give me more land, give me more money. And also with polygamy, he's like, give me more women. (laughs) Oh, really? Uh, Joseph. (laughs) Uh, And the women, you can only marry one man because there aren't enough of you to go around to me and all of my cronies. So, uh, but we can have as many of you as we want. Yeah, but then let's let's also take away your money and any power that you had, but only in the eyes of our church, but there's also the eyes of society. So, mm-hmm. like how do you how do you work that delicate balance? What do you do if this is your life? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's a there, there's a good question for you. I know what I would do, which would be run away and hopefully die in the desert because that would be better than this, but you know, that's just me <laughs> looking Absolutely. at it from the future. You know, and I think what you're saying right now kind of wraps into the larger perspective of this, this same article on L.com. It talks, the, the main focus of the article is about, uh, Madame Restel, I believe. Uh, her name was actually, uh, where is it? Where is it? Um, oh, god damn it. 
Um, Anne Lohman, I believe is how you pronounce that name. And uh, Madame Rastel was her alias. But she was known as, quote unquote, the wickedest woman in New York. And she was disparaged by so many people who were just baffled that she would be openly offering abortions and birth control. And I think there's a quote from this article that I think captures everything here. It says, quote, in court, the lawyers, judge, jury, and journalists were all men. And also we can insert into that doctors very soon would become all men and midwifery would slowly fade away through the 19th century. Maria was viciously cross-examined on the witness stand. Restell's lawyers to defend their clients said Maria was not to be trusted for as regards to women when they part with their chastity, no reliance can be placed in her that loses it. Maria, so, okay, so let me set the scene for why Maria was testifying against Restel, uh, Madame Restel. Uh, essentially, Maria had gone and uh, had seen Madame Restel to use her uh, services, and she had complications after her abortion, and a male doctor saw her and basically twisted her arm and forced her to testify against Madame Restel to get Restel convicted of uh, soliciting abortions. So, uh, Maria was, um, it, her testimony was disparaged on, on the stand because, uh, apparently when a woman parts with her chastity, no reliance can be placed in her that loses it. It goes on to say, Maria was called a foul, corrupt, a loathsome, guilty, a thing as ever polluted God's blessed earth by her pestilential presence, end quote. So maybe that offers a little context into how the men who were reporting on this and the men who were the lawyers and judges and jury and journalists and everybody, all of the men were discussing this. Oh, Maria, she was actually a woman who made her own decision about having a, a baby. And she went and used Madame Restel, who was a female doctor who was administering to only women. We can't have women with this much power and autonomy to control themselves. Um, it's it's kind of depressing to see how uh, they were so horrifically disparaged uh, just for wanting to be able to control their own lives. Yes, I I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> and uh, you're if you're detecting a bit of emotion in my voice, it's it's because there is um, because th this woman Maria. Um, the the reason she, according to this article, the reason that she was in need of services is because her employer had been basically abusing her and gotten her pregnant. And so then, like, there, that comes that whole issue of consent, you know, and, and ownership. Like, who was she as a person? Was she owned by this man? And uh, according to this article, the man, nothing bad ever happened to him. No, of course not. No, <laughs> no, because... Like, what is the, what was the incentive back in the day for the men in that courtroom to place any blame on the, the employer in the situation? Or, or to even try and see the situation from a different perspective, to try and see it through Maria or Madame Restel's eyes, right? They mm -hmm. just, they simply did not understand why a woman should be able to have these things or why why this was even an issue to them because because <laughs> the, <laughs> well, because of ownership right i think that's what yeah. we're getting at because they felt like they owned the women mm -hmm. and this if you're thinking about this from a good christian perspective it is also a good christian perspective that god commanded us to be fruitful and multiply I mean, that's biblical mm -hmm. It's also in the Bible that women are the reason why sin exists in the world and that God cursed women with pain during childbirth as a punishment for Eve eating the apple, even though that isn't technically written anywhere in the Bible. I mean, possibly it was a pomegranate, but still, <laughs> it, you know. Um, so the, if, if they are trying to follow their religion, what they, it would be – against their religion and therefore against God, if a woman, first of all, wasn't going to have the baby because what, be fruitful and multiply, why wouldn't you follow God's words? Mm -hmm. so would they choose to take power away from themselves by giving women who don't have any rights to give them a right? Eh, that doesn't seem so good. And do you really want to risk going to hell? Because yeah. a woman is has, was already sinful by not being married and getting pregnant because that's all her fault. Like, wrap it all in together. And there, there are reasons why she went to see Madame Restel. Think about it. Put yourself in her shoes. She was, she had no power 
she didn't want this baby, she couldn't support this baby, making it disappear solves a lot of problems. Yeah, and doesn't condemn her to a life of servitude in brothels or something, mm-hmm, or as yeah. a seamstress, or you know. And, and even then, it's like, d- what if she had the baby? If she did have to become a prostitute, what she would be choosing would be to die before her child was old enough to live independently. And if there are thirty thousand children, children, thirty thousand children living homeless on the streets of New York City at this time, that's not only setting her herself up to die a very unpleasant death, and also her child to live a very unpleasant life on the streets. Like, mm-hmm. what is the correct choice for her here? Is it exactly. to live that life or to try to get rid of this growing fetus? Like, you can use whatever terminology you want. You can say it's a fetus, or you can say it's a baby, or that it's just an embryo, or whatever. But the, the fact remains that continuing that pregnancy to term has dire consequences for her and a future child. Absolutely. And it wasn't just single women either. This is a quote from later on in the article that I think really supports how widespread the need for family planning was. It says, quote, by some estimates, one in five pregnancies ended in abortion in the 1800s. And of course, everything in this article is cited. So, you know, if you if you want to look up any of the sources, be sure to check the article. It was perhaps the most common form of birth control. And while dangerous, many women survived it. Childbirth was dangerous, too. And the maternal mortality mortality rates were high. Still, for the most part, it was not single women who were having abortions, but married mothers wishing to limit the size of their families. Now, it includes uh, includes a quote, uh, somebody who wrote a, a letter to Margaret Sanger, quote, I'm 30 years old and have 11 children, kidney and heart disease, wrote one mother to Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood. Can you please help me? I have missed a few weeks and don't know how to bring myself around. I have cried myself sick. The doctor won't do anything for me. Doctors are men and have not had a baby, so they have no pity, end quote. It it just really shows that they didn't have anywhere else to turn, even with women who had large families having another pregnancy because there was no other, you know, form of legitimate birth control that they could use. Abortion was their only way to plan their family as well when they were still so fertile and having 11 children already. So it wasn't just single mothers that abortion was saving. It was also already large families that couldn't handle any more children in the family. Bryce, did you know that when the birth control pill originally came out, only married women could get it? I did not know that, Mm -hmm. but I'm not surprised at all. That's Mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, because even when it came out, and it was not, it was not very well tested before it came out. Like the, the dosage that is currently used today in birth control pills is orders of magnitude less than the amount of, of, of hormones that are, that were in the original birth control pills. (laughs) So, yeah. So like, it's, it's not, I'm not exaggerating when I say that the original pills were seven to 10 times as strong as the ones that are today. Jesus. Yes. Wow. Uh I could abort an elephant with that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and the the interesting thing is that a, a very common misconception about birth control pills, and I know we're talking about today and not the early 1800s, but still, this is a very interesting point, is that birth control pills don't cause abortions. Like, I was raised being taught, like, oh, if you take a birth control pill, you're aborting a child potentially every single month. Well, no, that's that's not not how that works. preventing fertilization, right? Oh, not even that. It's preventing ovulation. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even before the fertilization. Yeah. Yeah, because you have to have an egg and you have to have a sperm and they have to get together and then they have to implant. Hooray. So birth control pills, like, they, they prevent the actual egg coming out. <laughs> so there's there's nothing to fertilize. Like so it, it you'll hear this um in debates even today about like why these there are a large contingent of people who for whatever reason don't believe that any birth control should exist at all um think catholic <laughs> because of again the fruitful and multiply. Mm-hmm. And so they they're like don't block anything but there were methods of birth control in use in the early 1800s that like that the women knew about because you got to believe that when your choices are do what your husband tells you and your husband is like I want to have I want to have sex tonight and every night and it's your wifely duty to do it and you like want to follow 
the rules of society and your household. So you do that, but you also know that if you keep getting pregnant, you're going to die and you already have 11 children and you kind of still want to be alive. Like these are the issues faced. And so there were, there were things that women did use like Madame Restel here. uh, She would, she would provide herbs and there are herbs that can cause a miscarriage. And so Mm -hmm. like that, but because they didn't have the option of like, yes, I'll just pull out a condom and take it from this nice wrapper that I bought at the drugstore because I can do that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that, that wasn't a thing. No, no, no. So she uh, was, she was, uh, Madame Rostel was the wickedest woman be, in New York because she would help women get those herbs that they needed. That's great. And then if they couldn't get those to, you know, cause the, cause them the miscarriage, um, then she would, she would help perform an abortion, which I, this is the point, and I, I apologize for laughing at this, everybody, but literally every single episode of my show, when we're, when Bryce and I say, we're gonna read DNC 78, in my head, every single time, because I am a woman of childbearing age, I think, of an abortion <laughs> because it de- <laughs> I know this all comes back. Some would argue the doctrine of covenants <laughs> is an abortion, but yes, please <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry for, for laughing, everybody. But a DNC is a dilation and curatage. I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'm sorry. Um, and it's a, pr- it's a procedure that's used to remove tissue from inside your uterus. And so I, it's used. Yes, it's used in abortions today. And there are different methods that, that, can be done um, to accomplish this task, but it could also be used to save a woman's life because the thing is you're getting rid of unwanted tissue. What are some reasons why you wouldn't want that? Well, one is you're pregnant. You don't want to be okay. There's also you were pregnant and something went wrong. And so that you were, you were trying to miscarry, which means everything that was growing needs to come out, but it doesn't always come out. And so if it stays in there, it can turn septic and you can die. Mm-hmm. So like it, this is a, this is a very big deal. And if you are ever in any group of women of childbearing age, particularly the ones who are actively having families, I guarantee you more than one woman in that group has had this done. I have had this done because again, I want to live. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, well, I'm going to be super honest here, everybody. I have two kids. I have been pregnant five times and a DNC has saved my life. Wow. Yeah. So like, this is, I, I don't want anyone to, to come away from this conversation saying, well, all abortions are always bad and all research into anything that could cause an abortion is always bad because the same That's things, the, the same things, the th- same things that can terminate what would have been a viable pregnancy can save the life of a pregnancy that wasn't viable. And it can be not viable because of something wrong with the fetus. There could also be something wrong with the mother. Like this woman in this article, she's like, I've had 11 children. I have heart disease. I have kidney disease. And if she has 11 children, she's not sleeping. So she is severely sleep deprived. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I let's can't talk imagine about Imagine what that would have been like. I, oh, God. Oh. Like, I've, I've had two. I was <laughs> like, I, I'm done, everybody. That I'm is done. Officially the ninth circle of hell right there. That <laughs> Excuse is what me. That, that, is. That, that is the 11th circle of hell Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right uh one yeah. circle for each kid yep there yeah you go. something like that <laughs> yeah so like until the day i die which will not be during childbirth thank god um like i will always want there to be research into women's health because research into women's health saves women and if you're saving women then you are saving children and you are saving the future of the world <laughs> this yeah. is a big deal Trust yeah. women when they have questions about what what is the best choice for my care? What's the best option for my existing family or my future family? Because women know what's going up because it is a deeply personal life and death issue. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you're here educating me and maybe some of the listeners on all of this because um, – what can I say? I had a Utah sex education class, so that should <laughs> sum everything up. Uh, but I, 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 I had a real life <laughs> education. I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I need to know this now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Exactly. Yep. Um, and which, yeah, I mean, even speaks more volumes to why I'm so glad that you were coming on today. Anytime, um, man. 
And and one, I think the last paragraph in the article sums up so much of what we discussed today. It says, quote, one woman, an actress, purportedly wrote a letter to Madame Restel in 1840 saying, quote, it was a lucky star for me under which you were born. God bless you, dear Madame. Uh, a newspaper printed it as an example of Restel's wickedness. But in our times, we might interpret this letter as a rare example of a woman's voice expressing gratitude for the choice to bear a child or not, end quote. And that's an important takeaway is like being able to have that choice of whether or not it's viable for you and for the child to have a child or whether it's going to utterly ruin your life. And what is the, what is the best option for this? Right. It's a deeply personal issue that, in my opinion, there can't be one blanket statement saying this is how it should always be done. Because, like, I, I personally, because I had cholestasis of pregnancy, I had preeclampsia when I went into labor. And that's a fancy way of saying I was going to die if I didn't have that children, that, that child immediately. And then he was turned wrong. And so I had to have a C section because there's like, throw, throw me back a hundred years. I 100% would have died during that. Um, Yeah. And so I opted to never have children again, because if I were to get pregnant again, there is, I mean, a conservative estimate, there'd be a a straight up 25% chance that I would just die. And that's not a risk that I'm willing to take. But another woman might have had that same experience and said, but there's a 75% chance I would live. I'm willing to take that and I will fight to the death for that woman's right to be able to have that, have another child if she chooses. Right. Cause that's, that's her choice. That's her life. Yes. That's her family's. That's not mine. I don't think that she should choose mine and I shouldn't choose hers. And leaving as many options for as many people as possible is inevitably going to lead to a better society. The more Absolutely. options that people have available is going to be better. So, Marie, the main reason why this whole topic came up is because we're discussing something in church history during 18 the the early 1840s when you are aware that Joseph Smith began engaging in polygamy. Uh, you quite, bet. Uh, he was quite so prolific, much polygamy. I, <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a poster on my living room wall, everyone, of all of Joseph Smith wives. <laughs> so I see it yeah, every day. Yeah. <laughs> I am and you very met aware. The artist at Sunstone too. <laughs> oh my god! I fangirled all over her. It was ridiculous. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Wow! Did I make a fool of myself? She's amazing. All right. Anyway, back to back to the topic of wives. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Many wives. Many many wives. So one thing that is interesting about church history is a person named John Bennett, and he's an incredibly polarizing. Uh, figure in early Mormon history for many reasons, but I don't think that he's given very much credit for the benefits that he was able to give to the early saints when polygamy started to become a thing. Now, what I mean is everything good that we've talked about today it with in, in relation to women's rights and abortions and the show, social stigmas that come along with having uh, fatherless children. Well, when you are living in a society that is run by a clandestine ring of men who are having sex with as many women as they possibly can, inevitably pregnancy is going to arise and women are going to be left with fatherless children. and then they're going to suffer all of the social consequences that you and I have been discussing today. Luckily for the women in uh, early Mormonism, Don John Bennett was there who was, um, I guess you could consider him a doctor, but doctor really didn't mean much back then. No. But there is an interesting quote, and this came from Sarah Pratt, who was a wife of uh, Orson Pratt. Okay. And I'm I'm going to try and keep this as spoilerless as possible, but there's just no <laughs> way. Okay. To, no We're way on to do your that. show. Spoil the heck out of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, this is a quote from Sarah Pratt discussing it, and this there's a lot of uh, controversy surrounding these quotes um, uh, d- 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 that include topic the topic of abortion in church history but i think we're we're just going to discuss them at face value here he says one day they came both john bennett or joseph smith and john bennett on horseback to my house bennett dismounted joseph remained outside bennett wanted me to return to him a book i had borrowed from him it was a so-called doctor book i had a rapidly growing little family and wanted to inform him 
uh, inform myself about certain matters in regards to babies, etc. This explains my borrowing that book. While giving Bennett his book, I observed that he held something in the left sleeve of his coat. Bennett smiled and said, oh, a little job for Joseph. One of his women is in trouble. Saying this, he took the thing out of his sleeve. It was a pretty long instrument of a kind I had never seen before. It seemed to be of steel and was crooked at one end. I heard afterwards that the operation had been performed, that the woman was very sick, and that Joseph was very much afraid that she might die, but she recovered. Bennett was the most intimate friend of Joseph for a time. He boarded with the prophet. He told me that, uh, once that Joseph had been talking with him about his troubles with Emma, his wife. Uh, he asked me, said Bennett, smiling, what he should do to get out of the trouble. I said, this is a very simple idea. Get a revelation that polygamy is right and all of your troubles will be at an end. End quote. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> well, that's a live reaction, everybody. Yeah, wow. <laughs> you oh have no God. idea. I, I didn't send you this article. No, you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I okay. So a couple things. First of all, yeah. I'm got, kind of glad he was there. Second of all, not so glad he was there. Yeah, because he was also oh. a bastard. I mean, he was he yeah. was a truly piece of shit human being. Let's let's not not mix any yeah. qualms about that. Okay. Yeah, because the I, the my first question is for the woman who had the surgery done. Did she have a choice in the matter? Was there anesthetic? Probably not, and probably not. Uh, yeah, that's true. Oh, God. Ugh. And also, was it her choice to have this abortion or was it because Joseph said, hey, you can't get pregnant with my kid. Your yeah. husband's on a mission. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, man. there's there's so much wrapped up into this. But also, there are the social implications that if she had the child, then also what would have happened to her, right? Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. there, this is a very mixed bag of moral conundrums that we're dealing with here. I did, Wow. Yeah, because everything that we just talked about culminating with that, I just – I feel for her and the entire yeah. situation because, you know, I'm going to guess this was not a unique situation if this no. guy Bennett, you said his name was? Yeah. If he stayed around, that means – the, the law of supply and demand, if there was no demand for his services, he would not be there to supply them. Yeah, absolutely true. And if there's any question about the historicity of these these claims, this is taken from the History of the Church, Volume 5, page 571, and this is a testimony given by Hiram Smith, Joseph Smith's own brother. Oh, my goodness. On the 17th. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm the, sorry. I'm just stepping all over what you're talking about. Keep going. <laughs> on, the, on the 17th day of May, 1842, having been made acquaintance with some of the conduct of John C. Bennett, which was given in testimony under oath by several females who testified that John C. Bennett endeavored to seduce them and accomplish his designs by saying it was right, that it was one of the mysteries of God, which was to be revealed when the people was strong enough to endure such or strong enough in faith to bear such mysteries. So let's pause at that before reading the rest of it. John Bennett was using uh, the will of God. He was saying that it's the it's one of the mysteries of God that we should copulate, that uh, we need to multiply and replenish the earth. Oh, my God. That's kind of messed up, dude. <laughs> oh, so messed up. Oh, yeah. Man. Uh um, yeah, quite the bastard. Uh, and, and it continues that it was perfectly right to have illicit intercourse with females, providing no one knew it but themselves, <gasps> vehemently trying them from day to day to yield to his passions. <laughs> oh, my I, God. Oh, yeah. my God. I feel ill. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it continues. Um, you're not done yet, Marie. No, of course <laughs> Bringing not. witnesses of his own clan to testify that there were such revelations and such commandments and that they were of God. Also stating that he would be responsible for their sins. If there were any, that he would give them mes medicine to produce abortions, provided they should become pregnant. End quote. Like I said, History of the Church, Volume 5, page 71, from Hiram Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith. He's the one who recorded that. So. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> John Bennett was an interesting addition to Mormonism for the entire, like, 20 months that he was affiliated with them. But, wow. Just wow. Yeah. As you were talking about that, the um, naturally, the thing that I'm thinking about is he's saying uh, – basically, he's saying, hey, my dick is God's will. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, like, is that the 1800s equivalent – of somebody on a dating site sending a woman a dick pic. Like, <laughs> check this out. This is amazing. 
<laughs> check it out. It's God's will. Uh, right. Those have got to be equivalent. some anointing oil for you. <laughs> oh. I mean, oh, what a uh, what a piece yeah. of work that is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and my. this this and uh, I mean him and Joe were the best of buddies for those 20 months. They lived in the same house for 9 months together when they had started practicing polygamy. So I think this offers a little more context into maybe some of Joseph Smith's motivations if he was at all influenced by this guy, John Bennett, who he considered yeah. his bosom friend for so many months. Um, well, if, you're, if your goal at this point in your life would be to sleep with as many women as possible, and you are a man who is doing this, and this guy showed up who you got along with, who could take care of any issues, that would be my best friend. And if I was the best friend who could take care of issues and this guy that was like in charge of this whole group of women and could get all these women to do what he wanted, wouldn't she want a piece of that action too? <laughs> oh my. Yeah. Yep. yep. Just throwing that out for the dear listener to consider. Yep. Just got to, you got to do the handshakes. You got to be, <laughs> you know, do, do <laughs> you know. Cross all the T's, dot all the I's, and then you uh, you can't get to heaven unless you have three wives. So, uh, yay, Mormonism. <laughs> this is the world I, that it, Mormonism yeah. evolved out of, people. The, the Mormonism people are practicing today, this is still in their Doctrine and Covenants. I can't wait till we get to that revelation. Oh, my God. Marie, I, <laughs> I, I have been awaiting this day for far too long. I cannot wait <laughs> To get to that revelation, it is going to blow your brain out of your face. I, it's, <laughs> I've always wanted to have my brain blown out of my face, right? It's, it's going to be great once we get there. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a very special, like, three episodes, because I have a feeling like it's going to take us a while to get through it. I, I uh, relish the day. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah. But that being said, um, uh, Marie, um, I want to thank you so much for offering your perspective. Of Do you have course. any closing thoughts on the conversation as a whole for today that we just had? Um, um, you know, I think I've said all my thoughts. And uh, if you want to hear more of my thoughts about Mormonism in general, uh, over at mybookofmormonpodcast.com, you get to hear Bryce over there. And it's the podcast where Bryce doesn't swear. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, right? It fucking sucks, man. <laughs> 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 but you and i have a great time so yeah it's head true. over there and listen to us but no bryce thank you so much for having me on your show likewise and thank you so much for uh for having me as your co-host on my book of mormon this is the first time that i've ever read through the doctrine of covenants and it has been enlightening to say the least and uh <laughs> of course thanks for coming on today it's been a lot of fun anytime Say what you will about Joe and Broke it practicing polygamy among all of their other shenanigans. It was an inevitable conclusion given the circumstances. You know, there are a number of situations throughout history we can point to where an insular society led by an insulated group of men begin to exert their power in ways that seem abhorrent to the outside world. A ton of religious leaders have practiced polygyny throughout history. And Mormonism was no different. Joe and Brokett couldn't really be touched by the law while they were living in the sanctuary city of Nauvoo, so they used that power to influence people to do all sorts of things seen as illegal and immoral to the Mormons and even to us today. If polygamy was one of the main byproducts of Mormonism in the Nauvoo years, let's just consider the logistics and morality given the 19th century society in which these practices were cultivated. Joe had had a number of supposed sexual indiscretions prior to this point, but all were surrounded with secrecy and controversy, and historians have a very hard time proving even the Fanny Alger affair. If Joe was going to practice polygamy all along in some way, isn't it best that he took care of the byproduct of having sex with dozens of women? In no way am I condoning what Joe did. But he did it, and given the social stigmas which damned those women with children out of wedlock, wasn't it actually the most moral thing for him to have Bennett perform abortions? Yeah, I know. I mean, Joe just shouldn't have fucked these women in the first place, and he should have stayed faithful to his beloved Emma all along. But that didn't happen. So wasn't him mitigating the consequences of his actions the best possible thing he could have done for these women in the long run? 
Think of it from the women's perspective. Joe propositioned them to join him in plural marriage. And when that didn't work, he usually went with commanding them to marry him and threatening them as an angel with a fiery sword. But every one of these marriages was only known to the very elite of Joe's cronies. And most of them didn't even know how many wives Joe had by the middle of 1844. The wide public had no idea this was going on until broke its expose. And even then, most of the Mormons denied it or didn't seem to care that Joe was having sex with so many women. But the inevitability with one guy copulating with so many women is childbirth. Without DNA testing, there was no way to know if Joe was the father of any of the babies who may crop up because an accused baby could just be written off as the child of the wife and her husband. Or maybe she went and committed adultery with some other uh, vagrant man that was living in town. But when those husbands were hundreds or thousands of miles away and their wives became pregnant, that was the evidence needed to shatter Joe's entire foundation and the public persona of the pious prophet of the people. If we consider the plight of Joe's wives in trying to make it through life with the child of a disgraced prophet likely being left by their first husbands once they found out about the situation, wasn't Bennett performing these abortions just as much of a favor to these women as it was a favor to his best bud Joey to keep the rumors from being proven? If adultery were proven by a bastard child being born, these women had very few options. So Bennett and probably somebody else after mid-1842 mitigating the consequences was really the most moral thing that could be done, given the situation. But a big problem of it is, I doubt that the women had much of a choice in the matter, right? Women didn't have much choice in anything back then. They were seen as property. Marie and I discussed this ad nauseum. So, I mean, the most moral thing would be to leave the choice up to them and to not have polygyny raging through early Mormonism. But that's not the reality of it. So given the circumstances, that was the most moral conclusion that I can think of. That's the thing, right? There's a lot of nuance to polygamy in Nauvoo. You know, and just as there's nuance to nearly every topic, historic or current. We can't see what it was like for those who lived under Joe and his elite high council during this time. We'll never be able to see the world through their perspective. We can learn all kinds of wonderful things with a quick perception change, but it really helps to hear what other people have to say. And who knows, we might actually learn something from it. We're going to be spending some time rooting through the journals of Joseph's wives as we continue to progress through Nauvoo. I can't help but apply this to today's narrative a little bit. The divisiveness with which we treat each other is something appalling to me. And I just saw a graph uh, that analyzed tweets from both sides of the political aisle, and it showed almost no crossover between the two worlds. Almost nobody interacts with people from the other side. Nobody wants to see things from the other side's perspective. Abortion is just one of these topics that quickly divides people. And while I try to stay out of politics as much as possible, this same divisive phenomenon occurs heavily in the Mormon versus ex-Mormon communities. Never is this more apparent than in a couple of blog posts by self-proclaimed Mormon apologist Dan Peterson. He wrote two posts titled, Can There Be Any Valid Criticisms of the Church? And then the second post was, Son of, Can There Be Any Valid Criticisms of the Church? Which was just a response piece to the criticisms he had received from the first post. Basically, Peterson presupposes the church to be true, and therefore no logical argument can be made that proves it false. His logic is obviously flawed, but all it takes is some perusal of the comment section to see both perspectives just duking it out with each other. I extended an invitation to Dr. Peterson to come onto the show to discuss Mormonism and Mormon history, and beyond that, I'm going to ask a favor of those of you who are active on Facebook. I don't think Dan is ever going to come onto this show just at my singular request, but if he gets a couple of messages from people who want to hear him on this show, he may reconsider. 
Now, I'm not very optimistic that he'll actually do it, but I'm hopeful he will. I want to ask him a simple question which gets to the fundamental point of today's show. Dan, have you ever asked an ex-Mormon why they became an ex-Mormon? Have you ever tried to consider a different perspective? I don't want to debate Dan Peterson. I want to ask him about his perspective and offer my secular Mormon perspective to him to see if we can make sense of each other's side. This is likely an exercise in futility because I'm never going to convince him that the church isn't true, nor will he convince me that it is true. But crossing the aisle and having a conversation with somebody on the other side of this gap can't hurt. And who knows, it may actually be enlightening to share each other's perspectives. So I'm asking this favor of you, the listeners. If you want to hear Dan Peterson on this podcast discussing Mormonism, send him a message, a a personal Facebook message, and let's try to get this to happen. He's not going to respond to just my, my little request. So I ask of you to go forth and multiply messages to Dan Peterson's inbox. You'll find a link to his Facebook page in the show notes, or you can just search it on the Facebook search bar, Daniel C. Peterson. Let's see how useful it can be to gain his perspective of Mormonism and judge that perspective based on its own merits. If we just do a quick perception check, we may find that we can learn about worlds without number. All right, that's going to do it for the history today. I did have a couple of corrections that I needed to address really quickly. First came in the form of a Facebook message from Jason Walker. This is what he said. Hi, Bryce. I just started your most recent episode of the Naked Mormonism podcast. As you were reading the charter for the founding of Nauvoo, you used the expression viva voce. It's actually a Latin phrase pronounced viva voce, meaning by voice. And, you know, when I said it, I said viva voce. So uh, he, he goes on to say, I'm sorry to have temporarily become that guy, the grammar Nazi. I'm normally nothing like this, but this gave me an opportunity to procrastinate and to also let you know that your podcast is awesome and the work you're doing is excellent. Uh, keep it up. Cheers or drink, Jason. So, Jason, thank you for sending in that correction. Uh, I've heard it said that there are those who mispronounce Latin correctly and those who mispronounce Latin incorrectly, and I apparently fell in the second category, so thank you, viva voce, instead of viva voce, as I said. Uh, thanks for correcting me. The second correction I had uh, came from a friend of the show, Julie. She did correct a date that I had wrong about god-awful movies in Salt Lake City. I must have had some kind of Mandela moment or something because I was under the impression that it was happening on October 8th, which would have lined up perfectly with the schedule. However, it's actually happening October 1st, and the prior day to that, I will be in Milwaukee, so there isn't enough time for me to get from Milwaukee to Salt Lake City in just that short amount of time to attend god-awful movies. So unfortunately, I have to rescind that claim that I will be attending God Awful Movies, I won't be there because I will be at the Myth Information, uh, MythCon in Milwaukee on September 30th. But that being said, there are still tickets available for God Awful Movies. You can check the show notes for a link. I would really recommend going. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sad that I'm going to be missing it, but uh, I would just go for yourself. I've been to a number of these live God Awful Movies. I have traveled far and wide to see these because they are just so funny. So please, please go if you want to sit back for a good laugh at a really shitty Mormon movie. So um, I guess that those are the two corrections that I had to voice really quickly. Uh, we do have a new patron to thank. Looks like the name Triceratops. I didn't know something that went extinct uh, so many millions of years ago had access to uh, the internet. But still, thank you, Triceratops, for pledging to support the show at patreon.com slash naked mormonism. You're keeping the lights on and keeping my face buried in books. So thank you so much for supporting. Once again, a huge thanks to Marie Kent for joining me on today's episode. Be sure to check the show notes to listen to uh, the My Book of Mormon podcast where we read through the Doctrine and Covenants. With that, let's shut it down for the evening. Of course, there there are the people who keep this show running on the background that I, I need to thank so much. 
Julie, I thanked you a couple of times already in the episode, but I can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you so much for running on the Twitter and the Facebook pages, for keeping the conversation going there, and for all of your correspondence. You're really a huge help to the show. Thank you so much to Jason Camo. He created the music that's used in the show that's going into your ears right now. Be sure to go to A Lost State of Mind and download his music there. His music is used with permission. Thank you to Craig Keeling. He did the artwork that's used on the show with his permission. Be sure to go to uh, weirdmormonshit.com to see his blog there. Legal services for this show are provided by Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres. Opening Arguments is a great podcast about secular and atheist law. Be sure to check that out if you have some time and interest in law. And listen to Thomas uh, winning the bar exam. <laughs> Of course, I need to thank once again all of the patrons who support the show at patreon.com slash nakedmormonism. If you'd like to get in touch with me, you can do so at nakedmormonism at gmail.com or by going to the contact form on nakedmormonismpodcast.com. All of that being said, most importantly, thank you to all of those astonishingly fabulous, phenomenally brilliant listeners out there once again for lending me your ear. I hope to talk at you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
You see this? You right about this? Ship Mormon Say just tweeted, These hurricanes are Obama's deep state using weather weapons against conservatives. Hashtag overheard at church. You may say it's not even worth engaging in conversations with these people, but somebody has to, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ. The preceding podcast is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC, copyright 2017, all rights reserved.